Good morning. My name is Dory Clark, and I'll be your liturgist this morning. I'll be reading from Luke chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. If you'd like, you can follow along in your pew Bible. In the 15th year of the reign of Emperor Tiberius, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod was ruler of Galilee, and his brother Philip, ruler of the region of Ituria, and, and uh, Tra Trachonitis, and Licinius, ruler of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight, every valley shall be filled, Every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Simply Christmas. We continue our series on this Sunday focusing on the candle of peace, but I just want you to know that from last Sunday on the candle of hope that I realize that sometimes people actually listen to what I say on Sunday morning. <laughs> it caught me a little bit by surprise, as you could imagine, when one of you after the worship service came up to me and says, David, I said, I think I, I got something for you that's going to be very, very helpful so that you, when you prepare your sermons, from now on, that you'll be dead on every time. And I says, what, what, what is that? And he says, kiss me if, just like you said on Sunday. Oh, keep it simple, make it fun? No, no. Keep it short, make it fast. <laughs> Thank you for those words of wisdom. I'll try to put those into practice. No one, as far as I know of, has ever heard a bad short sermon, so... It was on a particular morning when the five-year-old runs into the living room, football helmet on, uh, a cape of some sort tied around his neck, dragging on the floor a flashlight in one hand and a ball bat in the other. Mom looks at him and says, what's going on? He goes, nothing yet. <laughs> nothing yet, Mom asked. Well, you never know when something's going to happen, and I'm prepared for when it does. And he runs out of the room. She kind of thinks to herself, I could use a uniform like that. <laughs> you know, we are in some ways more prepared for the chaos of this world than we are for peace. When we talk about this simple word of peace today, it's hard for us to genuinely embrace it. We long for it and we want it, but yet it is this chaotic world in which we live in that reminds us that peace is so fleeting that peace is never really here. It's always going to be interrupted quickly if we ever grab it. Our lives can be to the point that I don't know if you're driving somewhere and the back seat is just a little too noisy for you and it's been going on for a while. Your spouse is trying to talk to you in one ear and you just really feel like pulling off the side road and says, can y'all all give me a piece of quiet? Did that sound just too familiar for some of you? I'm Sorry if I might be bending here just a little, I don't know. Peace that we try to live for is not really something that we're able to achieve or work at in any meaningful way I am concerned. I'm concerned because that we might 
have ways in which we can turn down the volume, but it, we don't have the capacity to really stop what is creating the noise. When Jesus was sent into this world to us, what we celebrate on Christmas Day, the angels sang aloud, glory to God in the highest and peace on earth to men, to women, to all people on whom God favors. I read that as to understand that a gift of peace is being given to the world. The peace that the world cannot achieve. It is even more interesting that angels announced Jesus' birth, and some 30 years later we have John the Baptist saying that we need to prepare for this coming of Jesus, meaning that in some ways we've already had 30 years. And there's been no lowering of mountains and no raising of valleys, no preparation made for the Prince of Peace possibly because of the chaos in which people live in on an everyday basis. Much of what you and I do each and every day is try to build somewhat a fortress between the world of chaos and the world in which we live, our jobs, our security, the financial well-being, the insurance that we purchase just in case chaos hits and takes away what we have accumulated can somehow be restored to us. See, we know how fragile this existence that you and I have to the point that when we come on a day to talk about that last week, the simple understanding of the gift of hope and now the simple gift of peace, the cynic among us can really get up and want to walk out the doors because there really is no peace that we've experienced here on this earth for a very long period of time in our life. We might have caught momentary glimpses of it in moments of in our life, but but it does seem as if chaos tends to rule. And hence, I think for you and for me, it is coming to understand that this peace that Jesus has to give, because Jesus announced to his own disciples after his resurrection, my peace I give to you, my peace I live with you, I do not give to you as the world gives. Jesus offers that to his disciples knowing that his peace is different than what the world uses as the word for peace. The peace that Jesus was able to, to have in his own heart and his own soul that when, able, when he was facing the, the chaos of standing before Pontius Pilate, knowing that his life was in the balance he did not stand there fearful, and he did not stand there as one ready to fight, to maintain and to keep that which he was about to lose. And that is so much unlike any of the stories in which we are involved in or read or witness or kind of shout at. We really want the 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 victor, the, the hero of the story, to be one who triumphs over the injustices of this world, to be able to by force take which is rightfully his or hers, to, to overcome the evil in such a way that it crushes it under its foot and that we all can shout a word of victory. But yet Jesus has this peace that we talk about that passes all understanding, that no matter of the circumstances, really even no matter the outcome, there is a peace 
that weathers the storm. that gives continuity, that keeps one connected with the understanding that God has all of our hands in his life and that there's a home that Jesus talks about in the chapter 14 in John that, that's, that's not made by human hands but eternal in the heavens that's prepared for each of us. Jesus reminds us that in the book of Revelation that there'll be a, a new heaven and a new earth. That this peace that we're talking about is a gift, not something that you and I can manufacture on our own. It is something that has to be received and has to become a part of who you are in the reception of that gift. There was a pastor who was visiting uh, one of his uh, members who was in hospice. It was generally his practice that when he was visiting for the first time, uh, when someone uh, is in this stage of their life to ask them this question that would kind of open up a, a pastoral time of, of listening and, and praying together. The question was this that he asked, have you made your peace with God? On this particular occasion, when he asked that question, she said to him, no, and I'm not going to. And that just took the pastor back just a little bit. And he says, why not? And she told him, he says, because I'm trying to rest in the peace that Christ has made for you and me on the cross. Do you see the little nuanced difference? In that it's not that we make peace with God it's not that we make a peaceful relationships with one another it's that we live in the peace that God only God can give to you and to me if you think about this There are not many generations that's ever lived on this earth that there's not some type of war or conflict that's going on in and around where we are. If you even want to think about just the history of our own country, a little over 200 and something years old, there's been so many few years of our own history where we've not been involved in some type of conflict, some type of war. Many of you have been touched by the death of someone giving their life in sacrifice for the freedoms that you and I experience, that we might be in peace in a world that does not know or keeps the peace. Hence, Jesus has something to offer you and me in this world that we cannot give it. The simple truth of hope and peace is that it's something that you and I need to receive from God that was birthed in this child named Jesus who grew in the fullness of God and in stature to teach us, yes, to die for us, raised for us, and sends the Holy Spirit to us that we might receive, receive that peace that passes all understanding.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.